her under tons of rubble. The M4 and three lorries crush a man in his car. It's a race against time to free him. I don't think anybody, particularly him, could have understood the gravity of the predicament he was in. An out of control chip hand fire forces a father to abandon two of his children. I was shouting for him to come down, but then the planes went over my head, cutting them off, cutting me off. And the family looks on in despair after their son plunges 50 feet down a disused well. All I could see was this very small exit at the top. That must have been when I really panicked. Firefighters race to nearly a million emergencies, often risking their own lives to save others. Sometimes they record their actions on camera, and as part of Fire Safety Week, we've been given special access to some of this remarkable footage. But as you'll see, some of the 999 calls they receive could be avoided if we were all just a little bit more careful. The Woodward family live in Swindon. On the 6th of March 1997, had it not been for brave daughter Laura, their lives would have changed forever. Well, I finished work around about 6 o'clock, got myself home, walked in the house, I was starving hungry, and I decided to cook myself a few chips. When you put fresh chips in, it just splattered up onto the cooker, there was no bread grill, and it just splat splattered up there. I cut my chips, turned it all off. I actually moved the panel. I remember moving the panel. Alan thought it was safe, but the splashed oil was a time bomb just waiting to go off. I smelt some smoke from the kitchen, and I went out onto the landing and shouted down the stairs, I could smell some smoke. He gets up and looks out into the kitchen. The kitchen was just a ball of flames. My first thoughts was to get the family out. I was shouting to them to come down. But then the planes went over my head, cutting them off, cutting me off. I was down as soon as they were up. And when I came from the phone, I went straight out, out the front, so... And then, re then realised that the children were actually trapped. I expected to see two screaming kids stood in that window. Ten-year-old Laura and five-year-old Tom were trapped. I was not panicking because I knew it would make my little brother panic as well. Uh, so I just got him over to the window and tr tried in to get him out. Luckily, just a few weeks earlier, oh, Laura received good, yeah. a fire safety Second talk fire. at her just scout like group. And then your mum and dad is asleep in the next room. Andy, the fire officer, came to scouts and he like that, told us about if there's ever a fire in your house, what to do. The lessons Laura learnt were to take any younger children with you, stop smoke coming around the doors with bedding and towels, and go to a window and scream for attention. I think the family were very lucky to get out in that situation. The work that Laura did was a sterling work. She managed to get the family out of a burning building by remembering everything she was taught previously by a lecture given by the brigade. She was, I mean, she was only 10 years old when she... She was able to remember what she'd been told and she was able to carry it all out. And she saved her own life and her little brother's life. And from when the actual 99 call went in to when the first fire engine got there, it was less than four minutes. And by that time, the flames were coming out of the top windows of the house. And that started from the kitchen, which is at the back of the house, downstairs. Just four minutes for the Woodwards to lose everything. It was just black everything was covered in this black and it's not like soot it's more like tar because it's sort of sticky it's black sticky stuff it was all over everything you couldn't even tell what had been I mean the dining room and the kitchen were just completely wrecked you couldn't you couldn't tell where anything or what anything was you know you couldn't tell anything things that really brought it home up in Simon's room he had his portable telly and stereo, and that was just one melted blob. You wouldn't recognise it as a TV or a stereo, it was just a melted lump of plastic. 
But Laura and Tom would never have been put in danger if the house had been fitted with a smoke detector. At the time, we never had smoke detectors, no. Laura had been nagging us for a while, because it's another thing they'd been told, they told them it comes from the fire brigade to fit for smoke detectors, even the, you know, the little battery ones, which they're not dear. So I since found out. But uh, we said, oh, yeah, we, yeah, we'll do it. You know, you do it. It's something you just say, we'll get round to it. But we never did. But uh, since the house has actually been refurbished, they've actually put smoke te detectors in wired to the mains, which are very sensitive and very good. <laughs> Two months later, Laura became the youngest person to receive a bravery award from Wiltshire Fire Service. I met the fire chief and he gave me an award for it and showed me around the fire station and we went out for a day. Very proud, very proud of her. She knows that as well. <laughs> if you do use a chip pan, then the message is clear. Never overfill it and never leave it unattended, even as it's cooling down. For the Woodward family, the lesson was learned the hard way. Chip pans are lethal. No, I'd never have another chip pan. No, deep up prayers, yes, but I'd never have another chip pan because they are so dangerous. Having a smoke alarm is an essential in everyone's house. It's probably all of our worst nightmare to be woken up by the smell of smoke. But if that does happen, finding your way out of the house through that smoke could mean the difference between surviving or not. Now, it sounds easy, I know. You probably think you know your own house like the back of your hand. But actually, it's not that easy. And to show you just what I mean, I've come to this mock house at the Fire Service College in Gloucestershire. Now, we're going to fill this house up with smoke, and I'm going to try and find my way out. To keep me safe is Fire Officer Brian Farrell, and he's got all my safety gear as well. And also, we've got a thermal imaging camera to record how well I get on. So, here we go in. and if you didn't get out within a couple of minutes, you'd be dead. So, basically, our uh, three minutes have saved time like that, aren't they? That's right. Do you know your way out? I do. Yeah. Do <laughs> you want to follow me? Yeah, take me out, take me out. So, the message seems to be simple. Learn the exit routes from your house with your eyes shut. I know it seems silly, but if you practice that with the family, if the unthinkable happens, you will all know what to do. And it could mean the difference between life and death. It's surprisingly horrible in there. Accidents don't just happen in the home, they happen around it. And that includes the back garden, as schoolboy Alex Bakeman found out when a well covering collapsed, plunging him into darkness. I had quite a vivid feeling of weightlessness, which was quite bizarre. And the next thing I know, I was 50 feet below and wondering what I was going to do now. Rescuing Alex from the well would require the expertise of the line rescue unit. They're a highly trained team who specialise in dangerous rescues with limited access. But before they arrived, the local firefighters were doing what they could. Although 
I had to take it for granted that he wouldn't be alive. I was surprised that he was conscious and able to um, communicate with us uh, quite legibly and coherently. Um, and that gave us all a great lift, of course, in that um, we were there to rescue a casualty rather than recovering a body. What I could see was um, just this very small exit at the top. And it, um, that must have been when I really panicked. Firefighter Tony Price was sent down to assess his injuries. I'm coming down now, Alex. Keep that on your head and don't look up. Here you go. The first 15 foot of the well is made up of flint. Um, flint is a notoriously sharp uh, lump of stone anyway. Um, so the jagged edges of the, the well themselves could have done enough damage to have um, caused him irre irreversible damage to his body. Um, the, the, the depth of the well, 55, 60 foot-ish, um, was deep. He was sat in a, in, in a kind of a crouching position. And the only impression we could get from what had happened was there, over the years, debris had been getting thrown down the well as a, as a junk hole, basically. And, and a lot of old corrugated iron sheets have been thrown down it, rusted over the years. So as he's hit the bottom of the well, the sheets have basically crumbled up like a cardboard box and took a lot of the impact of the fall away. But he was sat, tangled up in amongst all this, this debris. And a few minutes after going down, a, a stiff neck collar was sent down to me. I immediately put that on. Alex made him comfortable. We had a fireman's helmet lowered down, which we put on his head in case a small bit of debris and things falling down. Although the local firefighters were able to make Alex comfortable, it was up to the line rescue unit and their specialist gear to get him out. They were led by Officer Kevin Keogh. What's the space down there? Do I need to get him out, your man out of the way before I can do anything? If there isn't enough room, then we'll wish you out and let him get on with it. All right. It was difficult to assess for top, the nature of his injuries because he wasn't moving a great deal. He was moving his arms and talking, so it was obvious that he was um, not in a great deal of pain, but more shock, I think, than anything else. So we were very worried before we lowered anyone down how we were going to actually move them and get him back up and get him into any kind of stretch or sling to bring him back up. That was our main concern. So we put him in a rescue sling, which is just a sling that goes around the chest and legs and allows us to bring him up in a, a more of a seating position than a laying flat position, because we were going to have difficulty doing that anyhow, because of the narrowness of the tunnel. After one and a half hours, they were ready to bring Alex to the surface. From that point onwards, I was being lifted up slowly. It was quite a slow process. He was talking to me. Um, I, I didn't really think, it would have seemed natural, I suppose, to be thinking on the way up, to have a lot of time to ponder the fact that this was 50 foot and this was quite a drop. I don't think I was thinking that at the time, which surprises me. Both of his parents were there at the time, and both of them, they were, obviously they were very upset and worried. Um, they weren't able to at first get close to the shaft to be able to see the condition of their son. Um, so they were fairly, the agitation was increasing. Obviously it was very reassuring not to have been at the bottom of that well anymore, to know that I was on top. From that point on, um, you start to think about how long am I going to be in hospital? Will this affect my exams? Because I had exams in, I think, two months. Um, and what will be the damage? His uh, parents were uh, close at hand, and as soon as he came out, um, before he'd even been released from the stretcher, his uh, mother, of course, was um, taking the opportunity to uh, declare her undying love. Incredibly, Alex survived with only minor injuries, but he'll never forget the day he fell over 50 feet down a disused well. If you actually consider um, the fact what actually happened to me, the fact that I had a 50-foot drop um, and I've come out of it relatively unscathed, um, it, 
it becomes apparent to me that this was a very lucky escape. You do take a lot of things in life for granted. And just as I felt that the world cover would be safe, you probably think that when the light does go red, it is, it is safe to step out into the road. And in their own separate ways, um, both situations involve taking a risk for granted. So just approach things with an open mind and be aware of what you're doing. After the break, a pensioner is trapped by tons of rubble after a massive gas blast rips through her home. And survivors of Britain's worst ever motorway pileup tell their story. Firefighters are also trained to deal with the explosions which can happen when a gas leak occurs. This is a small gas canister. Have a look at what happens when it explodes. Now, if that's what something this size can do, imagine what can happen in a large-scale gas leak. Well, sadly, Gwen Harding from Mossside in Manchester found out to her cost. I put my hand out to switch the cap. I didn't get that far. A massive gas explosion had completely demolished Gwen's home, trapping her under tons of rubble. It then bedded me through the gas cooker and the sink unit, set me on fire. Firefighters raced to the scene, but even they were shocked by the destruction they saw. I've never seen Bonzo Street uh, looking quite like that. There was rubble um, all over the road. Bonzo Street was like a busy thoroughfare into town, and it was completely stopped. Looking up at the building, I saw a flat that was virtually missing uh, because it was a top corner flat. So it was as though it wasn't there. It was just large pieces of concrete that had virtually flattened it. And the raging fire to the side and the, and the back of that particular flat. No one could believe that Gwen had survived the blast, but the rescue was fraught with difficulties. There was still danger of further collapse. In fact, there was oh, masonry dropping every now and then. We had to fight against the fire the fact that then everything around it was tarmac, so that was melting, so it was melting onto the fire. And it, as it turns out, you can't isolate the gas as easy as that because it's, it's vandalism. Some fools have been stealing some copper pipe to make a few bob, and that's what's caused the blast. But if there's somebody trapped, everything else goes out of the window, and you just see the, the, the rescue, and that's what happened. It's burning, it's a lie to my foot, my foot. The next thing is, the water's coming still. Then there's a head comes through the opening, the little opening, and he said, I'm with you. Honestly, when I found her, I thought I'm gonna watch this woman die. I really did, because she was in terrible pain. She'd obviously been crushed, she had blast injuries. The next thing is, there was some water coming through. And I kept on shouting, you're not putting it on me foot. It's me foot. It's burning. It's burning. It's a lie to me foot. Me foot. I don't remember another thing after that. Against all the odds, Gwen was freed from the wreckage after three hours. I was very surprised at looking up, because by this time I'd then gone back downstairs to see how operations were going on down there. And I was very surprised to see that they brought Gwen out on a stretcher uh, with oxygen and put her onto the hydraulic platform and, uh, and brought her down. I think it was um, relief to everybody that we'd actually got her after such a long time and surprised that she was still out and alive and in one piece. Very amazed. When the fireman got me out, eventually, what I was told, that there was one mighty cheer. They got her out. And they were asking, was I alive? This senseless vandalism put Gwen in hospital for four months. Well, from all accounts, this left leg is the one I must have been kept shouting about. 
because this one is burnt from here down to the bottom and uh, the other one is burnt as well. The arms are burnt here, the hands, the skin just literally peeled off into a fireman's hands. I lost every solitary thing I had. It's a terrible thing. I wouldn't want anybody to have to go through what I've gone through with it. The explosion happened because vandals stole copper piping to sell, leaving gas to escape into Gwen's flat. Firefighters still can't believe their selfish actions. I live and work in an inner city area where there's poverty and people are going to make ends meet. But obviously if you are dealing with, 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 with gas, there's, there's, a, there's a massive danger. And if that gets ignited, you're going to get a gas explosion. And believe, believe me, I mean, they can just uh, rip houses apart. Today, although Gwen's scars remain, she bears no grudges. No, I don't hold the grudges. No use. I don't hold grudges against anybody. Life's too short for that. Life's very short for that. And believe me, I know it. Because I've lost a few months out of my life. After leaving hospital, Gwen was able to meet the firefighters who'd saved her. They didn't give me a chance to get in the doorway without the jump So One of them picked me up like a baby and sat me down. They were so thrilled to see me. They couldn't get out over how I looked then. In more ways than one, I was very, very fortunate. And I owe it all to them. The vandals that caused Gwen's suffering have never been caught. And fires through crime are a growing statistic. Last year, firefighters attended over 37,000 fires thought to be due to arson. They cost insurers over £2 million a day. This DIY superstore was destroyed by a suspected arson attack. It caused £3 million worth of damage. No one has ever been charged. School fires have become a major problem. This one in Surrey happened in August 1998 and is being treated as arson. And so far, no one has been caught. And this derelict amusement arcade in Ramsgate caught fire in May this year. It's suspected arson, but no one has yet been charged. But now firefighters have a new weapon in the fight against arson, and it comes in the four-legged variety. The aim of having a dog like Star is, is to reduce the amount of, of actual arson incidents, um, secure more convictions, take more arsonists off the streets, and, and generally make a safer environment for everybody. Dogs have been used to sniff out drugs and bombs, but now they're being used by fire investigators to find out if petrol or other accelerants have been used to start fires deliberately. The dog's capability of decoding smell is, is incredible, and I'm quite confident that if there's anything there to be found, she will find it within a matter of minutes. And when she actually tracks down uh, an accelerant, or she knows that one's being used and she knows the area it's in, she will actually try and dig it out she will use her paws to actively dig at the scene and once she's completely indicated to me that there's something there she normally just sits at the scene. Without the dog if we had to rely on the electronic field equipment we'd have to wait for that to arrive and we would have to painstakingly search the entire area using it and it could take eight nine hours perhaps to do a normal size house to do it actually properly whereas she's done it in minutes. Star is one of only three dogs in the country, and the evidence she gathers is helping to convict arsonists. We've attended some in the region of about 12 incidents with her now, uh, since she actually went on the run. And of those incidents, she's actually successfully found accelerants at three of them, um, and one of which resulted in the conviction virtually on that same day. Good girl. Good girl. 40% of firefighters' work is to road traffic accidents. Last year, 3,599 people were killed on UK roads, and many thousands more were injured. The driver of this lorry had a lucky escape when it skidded on wet roads and crashed into offices. 
the two people who sit at these desks were on tea break. One person died in this crash when it's thought a car tried to beat a train at an unmanned level crossing. The driver of this articulated lorry was fined after he overturned it onto a car, completely crushing the woman driver. She was freed after three and a half hours. Many of the accidents firefighters attend are caused by irresponsible driving, especially in dangerous weather conditions. And in most of those accidents, there'll be innocent victims whose lives have been put at risk by the careless actions of other people. On the 23rd of November 1993, Donald and Jane Barnard were innocently driving home on the M4. The traffic was, was fairly light. On the whole, it, it seemed to be going along at a steady pace because the signs were flashing on the motorway and uh, well, I think most people were, were obeying those signs. But suddenly the traffic ahead of the Barnard started queuing, so Donald began slowing down. As I was stopping, I looked into the driving mirror and there was nothing there. As I stopped, I looked up again and I, I was, just saw another lorry coming straight at us and there was just nowhere for me to go at all. There was nothing I could do, I was stopped. The lorry hit their car at 60 miles per hour, ramming it into the lorry in front. A third lorry then crashed onto their roof. It's still a vivid memory for Jane. It all went very, very dark, and there was the terrific noise um, that I can only describe as, as stones falling. Uh, and. Um, Eventually, I, I learned that it was this lorry that had hit us and that the noise was the glass in the, in the windows breaking. Jane managed to escape through a side window and was rushed to hospital, but Donald was stuck fast. I was crushed against the steering wheel and my legs folded up underneath the, the dashboard and consequently I was, I was just unable to move at all apart from the left arm, which was, was free. The serious nature of the crash sent Fire Officer Brian Watts racing to the scene. The impact would ordinarily have wiped out the front seat passengers. Uh, what was a family saloon was crushed to probably four feet long and two foot six high. So ordinarily one wouldn't expect anybody to survive. Seat belts or not wouldn't make any difference. Purely from the, from the crushing perspective of being crushed in from the back and from the top. I was starting to get quite cross because I, I want, obviously wanted to get out of the car and nobody would move the seat back for me. What I didn't realise, of course, was that the car was folded up. There was another one uh, literally squashing it into the, into the lorry in front and there was no way anybody could move the seat back. But I didn't realise that. To this day, I don't know how, how he was sat. He, we could just deduce that there was a, a body there and there was one arm that would move. I think it was his left arm. That was the only thing that would move. And he kept asking us to get him out. And obviously, we were doing our best. I was in pain because, in the first place, I couldn't, I couldn't breathe properly because my, my chest was crushed against the steering wheel and subsequently I found out that I'd, I'd got uh, some broken ribs which showed up on the x-ray. And also my legs, which are not the shortest of legs, were folded up underneath the dashboard. My knees were cr uh, crushed against it. And of course, with them being folded up and, uh, and unable to move, uh, I, I got cramp. Yes, it, it, it hurt a lot, but uh, <laughs> nothing you can do about it. I don't think anybody, particularly him, could have understand the gravity of the predicament he was in. It wasn't a question of sliding the seat back or cutting the seat belt or cutting the roof off. It was very, very difficult. I think it took us almost three hours. The total extrication in minus two, that's not good for anybody's soul, particularly somebody who's in deep shock. I was extremely cold, uh, very, very cold. I've never been so cold as that in my life. And that was, that was the agonising part. I was getting to the stage where I couldn't keep still. I was shivering so much with the cold. The 
the sheer relief when, when we managed to, to get him out of there was unbelievable. And for him to, to, to live to tell the tale of that particular incident uh, was good. But Jane Barnard still finds it hard to forget the suffering caused to innocent victims. I, I just feel sheer anger that people are not aware of what trouble and misery they can cause for other th people by being totally selfish uh, with their own driving. How many times have we seen somebody lighting up a cigarette or chatting on the mobile phone? whilst they're driving along one-handed, eating food while they're driving the car. I mean, it does make you angry. What makes me angry is the destruction and, and the death and the misery that causes people. Accidents don't happen, they're caused by people. Mechanical failures are few and far between. Most accidents are caused by people, by people not being responsible. The M96 motorway. Never heard of it? That's because it's here at the Fire Service College. It's used for training officers in disaster management or multiple vehicle pileups, and it looks like that's what's happening today. This incident involves 16 cars, oil tankers, a coach and a lorry. And to make it realistic, there are volunteer casualties who have actually been crushed into their seats and will really need to be rescued. The police are the first to arrive on the scene and assess the situation. The paramedics are also in attendance, and there's even an air ambulance. Thirty-five minutes since the incident started, and the first casualty is out. The officer being trained to oversee the incident is Lynn Betteridge. This training is very realistic. Get her out there, come on! It's a typical motorway incident. We've retrieved seven casualties, all uh, stabilised in, in different me methods, uh, and I'm sure the lads are, are, have worked really hard. And they're all actually, by the end of this three week course, will be instructors in RTA methods. It's exercises like that one which helped firefighters when they had to deal with the worst ever pile up in British history. It happened in thick fog on the M42 in March 1997 when 160 vehicles crashed. It's a day that will always remain in the memory of those who managed to escape. We stopped, the lorry hit us, we hit a car in front of him, we carried on turning, hit an arctic, come out on the inside, the doors flew open, passenger and myself just run. And by the time that had happened and we got out of the van and run to the top of the bank, it was no more than 20 seconds. She was running for your life. There was no doubt about it. Fire crews couldn't believe what they saw when they arrived at the scene. The southbound carriageway was absolutely, very much like a sardine can. The, the cars were, were jammed into each other the full width of the motorway right to the to the central reservation. It was just total chaos, total carnage really. All you could see was burning metal. It was like a scrapyard. Uh, it was just one large fire, one large metal fire. Uh, the fire was so severe that there was nothing in there hardly left to burn except the metal itself. Three people died in the pileup, but Officer Ray King knows it could have been far worse. If you start the thought process going, you could say, well, what if a coach full of people had been in the middle of that? What if a school bus had been in there? Day trippers on a coach trip? Anything like that. We had one or two scares where we were sifting through debris, and we thought we'd come across human remains. And, and the police and doctors and the pathologists then had the job to, to identify or to say whether the, the remains were, in fact, of, of human nature or not. It will happen again. It happens all the time. We just don't seem to take on board the seriousness of driving in fog. The crash still haunts survivor Phil Hutton. 
every time I get in the car, I still remember that crash, as if it happened yesterday morning. Just the same. That will never change. There's no excuse for it, pure and simple. There's no excuse for going fast on motorways in bad condition. The answer is slow down. You're going to get there just as quick. At least you'll get there in one piece as well. After the break, some more of the dangerous situations firefighters find themselves in. And coming to the rescue of our pets. Firefighting is dangerous. Every time crews are called out, their lives are potentially put at risk. Luckily, no one in this accident was killed. Yet at the scene of a fire, it's something as simple as a whistle to warn them that there is imminent danger, as retained firefighter Ron Upton knows only too well. Me and a, a colleague was going in MBA. We got up the stairs through the first room and entered into the back room, um, just putting the fire as we was going, and then we heard the whistle. So obviously we turned round a bit sharpish and was coming down and then came out as quickly as we could but obviously we could have done with going a little quicker. Ron only just made it out as this slow motion shows. But he feared the worst for his colleague. I was just numb for a moment because I turned round and thought my friend was underneath it. And I think there's two or three blokes just grabbed hold of me and trying to reassure me. Everything rushes through your mind then. You think of his wife and children. I think everything comes across you really quickly. But they was reassuring me and, and, and saying, don't worry, it's all right. And they brought him round from the back. But even after his narrow escape, Ron doesn't consider himself brave. I believe that everybody put in a situation would do brave things. So I, I feel that it's, it's a dedication more than bravery. Yeah. Here at Fire Service College, they teach safety as rule number one. But to know how to deal with fire, you first have to understand how fire works. And that's where this container comes into it. Students crowd into it to learn how to control potentially lethal flashovers. Paul Riley talked me through it. Now what a flashover is is a transition stage from what we call a partially developed fire, which it is now, to a fully developed fire. How hot is it up there if I were to stand up now? Be, right, as it goes to flashover, it can go to 600 degrees or above oh, right. very rapidly. Where we're at, we're experiencing no hotter than between 60 to 80 degrees. This may be the corridor to a bedroom, and we'd need to get to that area safely using this simple, short application spray. What we're trying to train the students to do now is use a minimal amount of water, making their way safely to where the fire is. Outside a different container, another killer situation they're being taught about is something we've all heard of, backdrafts. If you look at the bottom of the door now, the two doors, We've got nasty, thick smoke coming out right from the bottom there. That tells us that that entire compartment is now full of flammable gases. If you've gone into a compartment with that sort of stuff going on, you're going to get a long way into it before your backdraft happens. Now this is the point where you, as crew commanders in charge of the incident, are deciding whether you put people in there or not. What would your, be your decision looking at what we've got there at the moment? No, 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 no. Besides rescuing us, firefighters are sometimes called in to rescue our pets. Jack, the Jack Russell, is trapped in a drainage pipe, so owner Leslie Pratt calls in the fire and rescue service. Well, obviously the first thought was to, have to make a rough guess as to where the dog was down the pipe and to get my lads um, to work digging, digging a hole as quickly as possible so we could uh, get, it, get it out. But the soil is too hard, so they call in a JCB to help with the rescue. Chicken! 
The dog is frightened and moves further down the hole. Okay. Now, if we start digging... You think he's going further down? Yeah, he's going further down. We've got to stop him from going further down. He's stuck this um, mud. Um, yeah, where's the long thing? Where's the long thing? So you I can get dig it in. The... The angles wrong. No, it's straight. Come on. Yeah. As the JCB digs a second hole, Nick has a lucky break. You still see the dog? Um, I just happened to look down the, the first hole that we dug. And I could see the dog edging backwards, and eventually I just grabbed the hold of the back of its leg and just pulled it out. I absolutely adore that dog, and uh, you know, to have found him and to spend all day digging him out and then to actually get him out was um, fantastic. In 30 years of being in the Hampshire Fire and Rescue Service, I don't think I've ever seen anyone so happy and grateful at the conclusion of any incident. But Jack isn't the only animal to have been rescued. animals that get stuck in tricky situations. Roland Viney and his wife Linda were at their holiday campsite in Surrey. On the way to taking a shower, Roland noticed the drain was overflowing. I stuck my hand down the drain and started digging down and then all of a sudden a little pebble dropped behind the back of my hand and trapped it. After washing up liquid failed, a fire crew were called in to help. So when we first arrived it was just a case of jumping off, going over and um seeing what we could see, and it was just literally with his arms stuck up to his shoulder in a pipe, unfortunately. But it was all quite um, tongue-in-cheek at then. At that point, he was laughing, everyone was laughing and giggling because it seemed like a pretty ridiculous situation to be in. As soon as they got there, they said to me, how do you feel? I won't repeat what I said. <laughs> I said, I feel very silly. And uh, towards at the end, uh, I was getting very worried. The situation worsened rapidly. The pipe was set in thick concrete, so special tools were needed to break it apart. And then, Roland revealed he had a weak heart. It had turned from something that was, seemed quite easy and a little bit ridiculous, it turned into something a lot more serious. He'd eventually ended up getting stuck for somewhere in the region of two to three hours with his arm down this pipe. My hand, I couldn't feel at all. The arm was completely dead up from the shoulder blade down. The crew slowly managed to inch their way to Roland's trapped hand, but they just couldn't prise it free. They were sort of twisting and turning it, and uh, I said, Can I ever go? So I actually reached over and put, got hold of my fingers and twisted and turned it. And, all of a sudden, it was free, and I was just relieved. <laughs> and that was it, and I was whipped off out the ground and into the back of the ambulance. <laughs> I don't think I'd ever stick my arm down the, a small drone again. So on the eve of Fire Safety Week, if you want any more information, get in touch with your local fire station. Find out if they're doing any demonstrations or events this week. 
or you can look up the website that will be on in just a sec. But for me now, it's time to say goodbye and stay safe. At 8 o'clock next Sunday, as part of Five's Clone Zone, there's an hour-long documentary about Dr. Richard Seed, the American geneticist, who some have dubbed a modern-day Frankenstein. Don't miss The Clone Rangers a week from now. More than 20 million 999 calls are made every year. But how many are genuine emergencies? Good, call you through to the police. Oh, hello. Um, when you're pregnant, do you have to wear a seatbelt? No, please come out here. Yeah, cat's eating my house. There's a cat in your house? Yeah. Can I see if can help you? Yeah, I've lost my dog. You've lost your dog? Tonight, the hoax calls and the false alarms that are clogging up Britain's emergency services and costing lives. One gentleman could have been in hospital tonight because of this false alarm. It's simple as that. Crazy. Monday morning in Liverpool. Paramedics Richard Turley and Angie Staunton are on their way to their first emergency call of the day. That's our best access as well. 087, can you give us best access for St. Charles Parade, please, over? They've been called to a woman who's reported to have a leg injury. The woman's elder daughter had made the call. She'd already dialed 999 two days before, but the woman had decided not to go in the ambulance. You know, right. so people, ambulance people call, it doesn't mean you've got to go. No. Let them look at your leg and then they'll just stay by looking at it. Right, OK. Yeah. Where's the head? There. Right down. Yeah. But once Angie and Richard turn up, the woman changes her mind for a second time. How many stairs did you fall? It looks like another wasted trip. You hate yourself anywhere else. Are you relatively? I'm not doing no. so. No. So why have you not gone in before? If we're not going to take it and then you decide later on today or you decide tomorrow, that's going to be three ambulances and one doctor. We, we shouldn't be coming out that often for one thing, you know. So if you're going to come with us, come with us now so that we haven't got to send another ambulance out later on. Yeah. Yeah, really, it's, it's, it's wasting everybody.